Well, good morning, city. If you haven't met me, my name is James. Hello to the three people that are with me. Um, if you're writing down the date for where we are in the year for notes, um, you'll notice that we're in the third month of January already. Uh, is my mic singing? No, no longer. I, I read on Facebook that babies that were born on the 1st of Jan are entering grade one now. So uh, there's, there's quite a bit of January on, on our go here, but we're only in the third sermon of the year, and God has been leading us to talk about Jesus is our hope, and that seeps into every practical area of our life. So we've taken a look at hopeful community, taken a look at hopeful family, and today we're taking a look at hopeful work. Some stats to get us out the block. If you don't believe me, Google it. According to the last worldwide survey in 2017, as published by the Oxford University, South Africa has the longest working hours in the world. You can see that China, got, we overtook China in 2014 and have consistently been working the longest hours in the world. Despite this, gross earnings have gone down over the last four years by 30 million rand, which represents 5.6% decrease. A huge portion, as we know, of the, of the population is unemployed, and 16% more people over the last four years have indicated they are dissatisfied with their work. So the summary is this. Many people are unemployed in South Africa. If they are employed, they work the longest hours for very little pay and are increasingly dissatisfied with their job. I don't think there has been a time where there's more of a biblical need to have a look at the biblical hope that Jesus has in the area of work. And for us in the church to rise up and be hope bringers in this arena. I can't possibly address all areas of work in 35 minutes. However, there are two things I want to smash. Firstly, people feeling in this room, I have lost all motivation for work. And secondly, people feeling I'm a slave to my work. Does that ring true for anybody in the room? Well, two, our two headings for today, therefore, is hopeful purpose and hopeful power for work. Hopeful purpose, hopeful power, God's going to turn this around for us. So firstly, hopeful purpose. We're going to do a bit of myth busters today. You're going to have to participate with me. I'm going to read out a sentence. It's going to happen a few times. And you actually have to use your mouth to say true or false. Right? So this physically is going to happen. True or false, work is a necessary evil. True, you say. False, the myth is that work came in as a punishment with the fall, with the sin of mankind. It did not. Work was something God put in place long before the fall. And in fact, he made it perfect and good like everything that he made. It's like the Drakensberg on a crisp morning is work to the Lord. In the era pre-sin, there was work. There's sin and there's work now. And in the new heavens and earth, there'll be work again. Look what uh, God's purpose is for work. Genesis chapter 1, when it was still perfect, no sin. Verse 26, you must just tell me if I must change mics, bro. It's fine. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. The verse couldn't be more creepy if it wanted to be. I feel like over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, we've got to remember that next time we've got a spider in our bedroom that we have dominion. It's completely besides the point of the preach, but verse 27 says... So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And he said to them, here's your work mandate. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So here's our work mandate, that we are to rule over the earth. Although God owns everything, graciously, he hands it over to our care to cultivate. And um, as image bearers of him, we actually carry on the work that God began, that we are in the business of unlocking the undeveloped potential of the earth, leveraging it for fruitfulness and cultivating it 
like a garden. And um, we're rearranging things to be fruitful, bringing out potential. This gardening kind of work actually stands as a paradigm for all work that we do even today. You're actually a gardener. Take, for instance, music. You take the raw, unutilized physics of sound, take that chaos, rearrange it into order, and produce beautiful music. Take, for instance, taking unutilized fabric, rearranging and developing it into clothing that can be worn. Take, for instance, the untapped potential of the human mind and shaping it to teach it a subject. Take, for instance, healthcare, taking a body that's in disarray and using leveraging medicine to bring order to that vessel. And so the Bible really uses this as a paradigm that whenever we are bringing order into a place that's in disarray, and we are developing fruitfulness and cultivating things, we are in the business of subduing the earth, the original mandate, rearranging things. So if you feel like, for some of you in the room, my work consists 90% of putting out fires, you're in the original mandate of subduing the earth and cultivating it for fruitfulness. Carry on putting out fires. And um, I asked this question just philosophically, ne? why did God give this to us? He could surely have done this himself, subdued it and ruled it. Why are we in the picture? And the answer is because God is a God of grace. Doesn't wait for Jesus to rock up for grace. We have an undeserved position in Genesis chapter 1 that God says, join me as we together will rule over and cultivate this earth. So therefore, it is not that we have to work. It's that we're granted to work by God. So the Genesis 1 is already starting to reshape how we define our work. Mythbusters number two, ep two, you've got to literally use your mouths. True or false? Last time you weren't too good. True or false? Work is secular, ministry is sacred. You guys are getting better. One out of two. False. For example, I work for the church, lacquer. Is what I do more sacred than what you do from nine to five? For instance, let's say you're an electrician. The answer in the Bible is it depends entirely on your motive for your work. If you do electricianing for the glory of God, it's sacred, sacred work. Conversely, if I prepare a sermon to bolster my image, it's as secular as all day, completely secular. It depends on our motive of our hearts. And when I'm thinking of Jesus, oh, it's just so good because he didn't appear as the Greeks would have postured he would have as a philosopher. Nor did he appear as the Romans would have speculated as a statesman. Nor did he appear as the Jews were banking on as a king. But he came as a carpenter. And that is awesome. Because for 18 years before he went into public ministry, he was working with his hands. God couldn't give higher dignity to work. And you say, couldn't he have done something slightly more spiritual to prepare him for his sacred calling? And the answer is he was doing something entirely sacred. No, he wasn't. He was just using hammer and nails. Absolutely. He was hammering nails for his father in heaven with excellence. This is what Dorothy Sayers says about it. She says, no crooked table legs nor ill-fitting drawers ever, I dare swear, came out of the carpenter's shop at Nazareth. He worked with excellence for God, and therefore it was a sacred work. Paul the Apostle, remember that dude? He was a pretty spiritual guy, you'll recall. However, he was a tent maker. And he said, whatever I do, whether it's canvas and pegs, or whether I'm planting churches and preaching sermons, it's all for the glory of God. Martin Luther, bit of a ledge, he says, the works of monks and priests, however holy and arduous they be, do not differ one whit in the sight of God from the works of the rustic laborer in the field or the woman going about her household tasks, but that all works are measured before God by faith. Equally, A.W. Tozer says, it's not what a man does that determines whether his work is sacred or secular, but why he does it. So there's no such thing as a Christian job. There's only such a thing as Christians doing a job. And there are limits to this. Ne? You can't say, I deal drugs for the glory of God. <laughs> Nor could you say, I steal as unto the Lord from people. So 
the outlying exceptions, you understand God is not talking about blatantly contradicting his will, but there's no divide between sacred and secular jobs whatsoever. Colossians 3, Ephesians 6 says it like this, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord, you will receive the inheritance of your reward. You're serving the Lord. Ephesians 6, obey them, being your employers, not only to win their favor when their eyes on you. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever they do. So if you're a student, that's your work. Do it for the glory of God. If you're a stay-at-home parent, do it as unto the Lord. If you're doing household chores, that's for the glory of God. Do it in a way that glorifies God. If you're volunteering for church, in fact, you're volunteering for God. Do it to glorify Him. Whatever you do, do for the Lord. Because everything is under His Lordship anyway. Ne? So our goal at work, contra to the Joburg narrative, is not to advance our career, put money in the bank, or t- for our position of power, or any such thing. Even to please our employer, it's to please our God, who's the employer of all. And the Joburg mentality is it's about my skill. It's about my creativity. It's about my career. It's about me. God says it's not. It's in fact about me. According to Ephesians, God is watching even when your earthly boss has no clue. And this speaks directly to this complaint where people say, my biggest issue with work is my boss, who's an absolute terror, makes my life a misery. That might be true. They might be an absolute chop. However, just realize they are not your ultimate boss because the head of all departments is the Lord Jesus. And we are working for him. And he says we are to do the following, as it says in Titus, to be submissive to our own masters, which is our employers, in everything. We are to be well-pleasing, friends, not argumentative, not pilfering, not show, but showing all good faith, so that in everything we may put on, adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. And I think it all is summed up by that phrase, showing all good faith. That involves being prompt. That involves being, doing excellent work, meeting deadlines, and doing it all with a godly attitude. So yes, he might be a chop, but the more chop-like your boss is, and the more faithfully you work, the more you put on the gospel. Working for an easy boss doesn't put, adorn the gospel as much as the one who doesn't deserve it. And just remember this, that whilst we were hard-heartened and absolute scumbags, Jesus died for us. So now we don't work for our boss out of the merit of what they deserve. We, we serve them out of the merit of what we didn't deserve, which was grace from Jesus. So our motives are completely, completely flipped on the head. Mythbusters Ep 3, true or false? You guys were good last time. If you had a Christian boss, things would be better. You guys took a while. You knew the right answer was false, but you wanted to say true in your heart. The truth is, it's a tougher assignment, according to the Bible, with a Christian boss. 1 Timothy 6.2 says, Those who have believing masters, which is in this case employers, do not show them disrespect just because they're fellow believers. Instead, we should serve them even better because... Their masters are dear to them as fellow believers. So you don't get to pull the Christian card, Oaks. You don't get to say, sorry, boss, I'm late. I was just reading the book of Leviticus. (laughs) Mm, Glory. Getting full of the Spirit. And you know, boss, what it's like getting full of the Spirit. Getting carried away. Nor can you say, I'm sorry I wasn't there yesterday. Things aren't well at home. And you know, boss, the primary ministry is in the home. And I just felt in the Lord that I should press deeper with my kids and my wife so that we can become a family that's worthy of the name of Jesus. Shanda Boshaya, praise his name. (laughs) And that's why I couldn't be there. You don't get to pull that card because the Bible says, serve them all the better. Be more prompt, be more excellent, be more concerned about serving them with all your might because God said, serve them all the better. Simple as so. Now, I want you guys to know that you're on mission when you're on work. This has not just got to do with evangelizing. Never mind that for the moment. You're on mission because you are showing you are God's workmanship through your godly workmanship that you put out. 
Your witness primarily at work is the following, to show you are God's workmanship through your godly workmanship. So motivation for work, let's sum it up. It's not that you have to work. It's that you graciously are granted to work. And your work is a high work, friends. It's cultivating, bringing out the potential fruitfulness of the earth. And we're not motivated by money or position or power or such garbage because we're working for God. And therefore, it's a holy work and a privilege. Amen? That's motivation for work. Now, second heading, hopeful power. This is where the rubber hits the road. Psalm 127, verse 1 and 2. What's the power to live out this godly work? Listen to this. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is in vain, does this sound like your life, that you rise up early and that you go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. According to this psalm, there's a type of work that is completely in vain, that God does not get behind, and that he hasn't attributed his power to accomplish. And that, that work is self-reliant work. Put conversely, or positively, God joins in on and blesses every work endeavor that is humbly reliant upon Him. Unless the Lord. Three words laden with God reliance. So it's a massive theme in Scripture that God loves humility and He loathes pride. The Apostle James takes it much further. He blows it out the water. James 4, 6, he says, But God opposes the proud. And he gives grace to the humble. So it's not just passive. He doesn't just love and loathe humility and pride. He will go out of his way to give grace to the humble and to oppose the proud. So take that into the realm of work, which is the topic of Psalm 127. And you get this, that God graciously gets behind and blesses all work that we do in a posture that's reliant upon him to accomplish. Conversely, he at best doesn't support, at a medium frustrates, and according to his word, at worst opposes all the work that you do that is reliant upon yourself. Now, this Joburg emphasis, we have to recognize where we live and what the sort of feeling is of people and what we're surrounded by is Joburg mentality and overemphasis on you your work output, and we are all like a bowling ball that has a leaning that we're all about. It's about me in what's going to be productive. We don't lean enough towards unless the Lord. As Joe Burgers, this is our bias. So if you think of this farming gardening analogy, né? farming is blatantly God reliant. We can't get around it. The, on the plus, you can plow, you can sow, you can hoi fertilizer, but unless there's rain and sun, it's all in vain. But the revolution of the psalm is all work is equally God-reliant as that when you go down beneath the surface. And we live under the deception that it depends upon us and not an, enough of unless the Lord. So look what Paul says, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. He says, I planted, some other dude watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything but only God who gives the growth. So we can clock our efforts, and we should, but we're not anything. God gives the growth. In our work, our works have value, but it is secondary value to what God accomplishes. And work hard. That, the, the Bible says that, but rely upon God for the results. You know, Madiba, for all of his Christ-likeness and all of his brilliance, his favorite piece of poetry was a bit rubbish, and unhelpful. Invictus, I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. No, you're not the master of your fate, nor the captain of your soul. Paul says to the Athenians, the fact that you're breathing is a gift from God. We are entirely not, and God is the captain. But Joburg tendency that you need to be aware of is futuristic self-reliance is the name of our city. Look what James says to us. 
Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we'll go to such and such a city and we'll set up a business and we'll turn over some profits. Have you ever heard someone talk like that in Joburg? Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Beware the deadly poison of Joburg's futuristic self-reliance. God opposes the proud. Just dialing back, what kind of work does God get behind and bless? Work that is humbly reliant upon Him. So what does that actually look like on a daily basis? Thank you, preacher, for the rebuke. But how does that look? Well, the psalm, I think, gives three, three ways that we can do it. First, these, verse 2 says, It's in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest. Evidence one of God-reliant work is that God-reliant work sets limits. God-reliant work sets limits. And um, why would we limit our work? Isn't that daft? Doesn't that actually subtract from the produce we could do? In fact, our efforts, even when they're limited, when they are God-reliant, achieve infinitely more than the best of our efforts self-reliant. Some of you look confused. Our efforts, even when they're limited, when they are God-reliant, produce more than the full measure of our efforts self-reliant. So we should do a more smart thing here, just for the sake of productivity alone. And how should we limit our work? Well, just three small practical implications in your city groups you can talk about more. You might want to put a limit on your time that you work every day. You might want to say, I'm working this many hours, and the rest I'm praying and leaving up to faith, to God. Counter Joburg, but it's a kingdom principle. Second limit you might want to put in is a physical limit. You might want to say, I'm working at work, I'm not bringing it home, or I'm working in the study, I'm not bringing it to the bedroom. We say, Laura and I, the bedroom's for love, the study's for work. You might want to put in a device limit. You might want to not allow emails on your phone or turn off certain devices on the weekend or turn off your phone after a certain time. You weigh it, but there are ways to be setting limits in order to make yourself God-reliant. Second thing that we see here. It goes on to say, it's in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil. Second evidence of work that is humbly God-reliant is work that is not anxious, that is non-anxious. Some of you say, what the heck is that non-anxious work? Well, anxious toil is going about our work in a manner that there's a background hum of anxiety. We're always troubled. The whole of our work experience is like this. It's like tense. And Laura and I have found we need prayer to overcome this. Laura already struggles with anxiety off the bat. doesn't take a big trigger to send her over the edge. And so we have found it a discipline that has to happen every night that we go through Laura's prayer list of work. Literally, she'll write out on the A4 page, line for line, everything happening in her company every project she's involved with and not, and everything coming up in the pipeline. And we will meticulously pray through that list. We'll lift that. Let me just give you a snapshot, just because I've got microphone, of what that looks like. We will say, Lord, we thank you for this project. But we just recognize, Lord, this is your project first. It's not Laura's project. We hand it over to you right now. We ask you for wisdom for this schedule. We forgive the pronkers that messed it up. But Lord, will you provide wisdom to arrange this chaos into something godly? Lord, give her favor as she books flights. Give favor upon those prices to meet the budget. Lord, will you empower her with wisdom for the task you've given her and empower her by the Holy Spirit for your glory to do it with excellence? Next item. What's next, bugs? This person did this or that. Lord, we forgive them. Lord, we pray tomorrow that we, you give, we get a word for them, that we lift them up, that we encourage them. Lord, we pray for a moment of kindness. We just go through everything because we realize we're dead in the water, treating work like it's secular and church like it's sacred if we're not praying through the things of work. So there's three brilliant effects of praying through your work. Firstly, it's like Miley's wrecking ball. 
plowing through the sacred secular divide. Secondly, you get answers and solutions for work from God. That's friends in high places. It's a good advantage. And the third one, which is what I'm actually supposed to be preaching about, is that it takes away this dreadful, fearful anxiety eating the bread of anxious toil. We're living out what Philippians 4 says. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, thank you, Lord, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And when you do that, yes, the toxic fear goes away. But one thing never goes away. It's the healthy stress of working hard. Let me qualify that. When you go to the gym, it's good that you stress out your body to, to make it work out. When you're studying, it's good that you stress your mind, stretch it to learn more. It's also good and godly that we have a healthy work stress that's working hard for productivity as for the Lord. But what's not good is this eating the bread of anxious toil rubbish, which God wants to root out of your life in 2020 through a life of vigorous prayer to get that going out. Personally, I found in ministry, you are susceptible to exactly the same. I remember when we were preaching Drawn Out, you know, the series about how Moses was drawn out for great purpose and so are we. Well, I was in the team that came up with that series. And in fact, if I remember correctly, Dungs can tell me if it's yay or nay, that I think I've mapped out what the different sermons would be. And yet the day before our preach meeting, it's late on a Wednesday night and I have nothing written down despite two days of trying to prepare a sermon. And I was riddled with anxious toil in my heart. And I said, Bugs, please come pray for me. And after that time of prayer, the miracle happened. And I felt in her prayer that somewhere the word sovereignty was mentioned about God. And I felt two things. Yes, I'm a bit nowhere right now, but God is still sovereign. And secondly, I should fear him and not fear man, because I was fearing the opinion of my peers and you guys on a Sunday. And that ended up being the two points of the sermon that I preached. God is sovereign, and we fear him and not man. God will even turn that weakness that you're experiencing at work into victory on his behalf. Don't submit to this without prayer. Now, I've spent way too long on that. Point number three, which is actually the big deal here. Work that is humbly reliant upon God takes the time to rest. This sounds obvious, ne? But here's the revolution of the psalm. Is that sleep is not just a mechanism to reboot your system so you can get up again and do work, which is the main point of life. That is not the meaning of sleep. But in fact, sleep and rest is a gift from God. And when you graciously receive it into your life, it's counted as worship to God and saying, Lord, I'm reliant upon you. I love you. And so this thing about resting, the world says, go to sleep later. Get up earlier so you can have more money, more provision. That's logical. The Bible says, no, no. You rest, receive this gift, and God will work on your behalf. And there's a type of work that God does when you're not working, according to the Bible. That there's a type of work God does when you're not working. He goes into bat when you're out, which for the proteas is frequent <laughs> at the moment. But there's hope for the proteas. I should have written it on the board over there. Um, but your best efforts pale in comparison to God lifting a pinky. Unless the Lord, there's a component about work that God does when you're not laboring. Look what it says in Mark 4. Jesus spells this out. He says, the kingdom of God is like this. It's as if a man should scatter a seed on the ground. Good, he's working. Verse 27, he sleeps. He rises night and day and the seed sprouts and he grows and grows. He knows not how. There's a, he, I know not how component to your work when your work is God-reliant. Going into rest. By faith, we go against the grain. The grain being, I've got to do this, I've got to do that, I've got to do that. And against the grain, we say, but Lord, in faith, you say, and by your wisdom, I bow to it, that you will work on my behalf if I rest in a way that worships you and thanks you for that gift. And um, 
I wrote here, do you know the things that God will achieve for a person who's willing to lay their head on their pillow as an act of faith? God wants to work on your behalf because he loves you. God will achieve so much more with faithful rest than you can imagine. When I was still working at uh, Foghound Studios as a video editor, I was working on TV reality shows. And um, lots of these TV reality shows don't have, obviously, a preset story and script. You just go film, you get what you get, and then the editor has to piece it together like a jigsaw puzzle. And the project goes on for like six, uh, six months of editing. So can you imagine trying to set limits and rest? It's just never ending. So they reached a point, and I was trying to live this out, when I was saying, Lord, it's late now. I'm downing tools, but I'm not just downing tools. I'm downing tools in faith. Saying, Lord, you act on my behalf here. Perhaps the Lord will act on my behalf, and in the morning, he will give me the, the breakthrough that I need for these segments. And I'd go rest in him as a gift. And I kid you not, in those mornings, many a time, God would supernaturally, miraculously piece together editing segments that were impossible for me the day before. And some skeptics in the room saying, that's just the, a fresh brain and nothing more. I know how good my work is with a fresh brain and it's mediocre. In the mornings, not my time to shine. I know when that segment comes together, it's because the Lord acted on my behalf and I count it as worship and gratitude to him. Do you ask God for solutions for things in work? Do you go to bed resting in him saying, Lord, I've got a flip load to do, but you are sovereign and I trust you in it. Now, I realize as I'm preaching this, let's just first give some practical applications. Write these down if you will, or just be in a city group and you've got it covered. Are you limiting your work? What actionable steps can you take towards God reliance at work? What steps can you take to move out of a zone of anxious toil in work? And how can we achieve a better blend of rest and work? Some of us in the room might be saying, actually, self-reliance is just the story of my entire life. Well, Jesus has an invitation for you. He says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Is anyone burdened and weary? Jesus is calling you today. He's lowly in heart. There's rest for your soul in him, and he doesn't demand your best performance nor does he demand any performance from you because the work is finished. And we see this exchange on the cross that Jesus is in a place of unrest, crying out to the Father, why, God, why? He enters into our unrest of our soul that we earned and deserved for our insufficient work in order that we, who don't deserve it, might enter into the rest Jesus deserves. And we then have this revolution that we don't come to work and get weary. We come to work from a place of rest. Rest being Jesus, not holidays at the vol. That is the supernatural exchange that Jesus has for us. And I find that such a grace. So, I want to end off with something that is a little bit different as the band joins me on stage. I want to end off almost the same way that when a pastor gets ordained to lead a church, for that holy task, they stand up here, people lay on hands, and they are given a charge from Scripture and a prayer. I want to do that for everyone who's working in their various holy tasks for God today. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to read out to you different areas of work. And I want you to stand with your group. And we're going to check one another, but you're going to stay standing. And then we are systematically going to stand up and stay standing. And I'm going to give us a charge from Scripture, from God. And then I'm going to give us a prayer. And we're going to worship God. Does that sound good? If you're unemployed, stand with a group that you have worked with or that you want to work with in the future. Just so no one's excluded. Né? Firstly, can I ask, everyone who is a creator or in the entertainment and media industry, please stand. Please stand, yeah. Lacquer. Glory. Everyone who's an entrepreneur, please stand. Yes. Yes. 
Look at all those entrepreneurs. Anyone who's in finance or business or retail, please stand. Yo, we still got a lot outstanding. Here we go. Anyone in engineering and construction, please stand. I just thought whoever's retired, because it's not on my list. Whoever's retired, please stand. <laughs> Anyone who's in healthcare, please stand. Anyone who is in education, please stand. You're going to stand up for both uh, two different ones there, Jen. Anyone who's in government or public services, please stand. Anyone in law and law enforcement, please stand. You putting up your hand as if yes, me too for that other category. Scholars and students, can you guys stand as well? Stay-at-home parents, please stand with us. That's a work for the Lord. Faith-based professions, please stand. And all non-profit work, please stand. And if I haven't mentioned your category, please stand and tell me what that category is so that afterwards I can get that right too. Now, I'm about to give you a charge, but it's not coming from James now. It's coming from the Word. This is God's charge to us. I'm including myself, but I'm going to use you wording as I give you a charge. This is from God. Work with your hands as we instructed you so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. Don't be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in the spirit. Serve the Lord. So as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man. That is my charge to you. Please close your eyes. Lord, I pray for this workforce of yours, and I pray first for the unemployed father, give them favor and give them work to work for you. Lord, I pray for every employee standing now. I pray for the, you to use them mightily in the days to come in Johannesburg and in South Africa. Use their hands and their minds to transform the city for your glory, Lord. Might you stir us to live upright and holy lives before others, working with zeal, not only when oaks are checking, but always. And whatever we do, we work heartily for the Lord, because that is our worship to you our Lord and our Savior and our sovereign King, Jesus, the Lord of all hope. Amen. Let us sing.